Hi everyone, it's Sunday. Are you ready for story time? This week's special guest I brought on because of the title of the book that we're reading. We're gonna be reading a book called Raising Dragons. So, I brought on Bob. Bob is a bearded dragon. Now, bearded dragons get their name because they have all this extra skin underneath their, their bottom jaw here. And when they get mad, that skin turns dark black, makes it look like he has a really thick lumberjack beard. And that's how they got the name Bearded Dragon. Now, Bearded Dragons aren't real dragons. They don't have wings, they don't breathe fire or anything like that. But a lot of times, lizards get named dragons because of the way that they look. So he's got all these cool spikes across his body. He's got these armored looking scales that can be kind of scary and intimidating looking. And because of that, he got the name Dragon. And just like a lot of other dragon names that we have um, in the lizard world, like Water Dragon and Frilled Dragon, uh, they get the look because they look really, really odd, or they have these cool features that we saw in drawings that people made of, of dragons that like would breathe fire, or would be in like a Knights movie and stuff like that. So Bob, though, although he doesn't breathe fire, uh, he sometimes gets these really cool bright red, yellow, and orange colors across his body. And that's because of the habitat that he lives in. Bob is from Australia. So there's a couple different types of bearded dragons. There's inland and coastal and a couple mixes. So basically just where they're from. But for the most part, his skin colors are to match the surroundings that he's in. So he lives in a lot of rocky areas, um, different types of sand, light colored dirt. And so because of that, it helps him be able to blend in with all the things that are around there. Now, Bob is also an omnivore. Omnivore means that he likes meat and he likes vegetables. So in the store, he gets cockroaches and he gets crickets, uh, but then three days a week, he also gets a salad. He likes collard greens, mustard greens, and radish greens, uh, carrot, zucchini, sweet potato, summer squash. He gets all kinds of good stuff. And just like us, we have to make sure that he eats his veggies so he ends up nice and healthy. Now, they can be very, very cool lizards. I kind of call them the dog of the lizard world. They're pretty laid back. They like just hanging out, doing their own little thing. For the most part, he'll hang out on my shoulders. So what I'll probably do is just have him up on my shoulder while we end up reading our book. But I think I'm gonna turn him around so he's actually facing us. There we go, Bob. You wanna watch the camera? Hmm? You know, everybody see your beautiful face. All right, so we're going to read Raising Dragons by Jardine Nolan. And a quick note about the author in the back, it says that Miss Nolan is author of several books and she often wonders what it would be like if she had been raised on a farm, especially one with a dragon, because that would be extra special. So here we go. Pa didn't know a thing about raising dragons. He raised corn and peas and barley and wheat. He raised sheep and cows and pigs and chickens. He raised just about everything we needed for life on our farm, but he didn't know a thing about raising dragons. Ma didn't know about dragons either. She made a real nice home for us, but when it came to dragons, she didn't even know what they wanted for dessert. Now for me, I knew everything about dragons and I knew they were real. At first, Pa thought the notion of dragons on a farm was just plain foolishness. I'm not too particular about fanciful critters, and I don't have any time for make-believe, he told me one day. So when Pa said he didn't want to talk anymore, I knew I'd better keep my opinions to myself. I did my chores with my thoughts in my head at one end of the barn, while Pa worked at the other end with his thoughts. Give me one second. There's a fan blowing, and I'm going to turn it off. I know I should probably edit the video so you don't see me do that, but I always tell everyone I don't edit my videos because I want it to be more like real life. So there's things we forget to do in real life, like shutting off that fan so I don't have that noise in the background. So I'll be right back. Much better. I like pointing out that we all make mistakes and making mistakes is okay. So. 
Sometimes I forget to shut fans off in here or sometimes I forget about turning the lights on all the way and sometimes they might shut off on me, but that's okay because we all make mistakes. So anyways, back to our story. I remember the day my life with dragons began. I was out for my Sunday before supper walk. Near Miller's Cave, I came across something that looked like a big rock, but it was too round and too smooth, not hard enough to be a rock. Carefully, I rolled it into the cave and went to fetch Pa. What do you think it is, Pa? An egg? Big egg, was all he said. Now you stay away from that thing, daughter. No telling what'll come out of it. I couldn't tell if Pa was more scared than worried. You just stay away, you hear me, he said, pointing a finger. I always minded my parents, never had a reason not to. And I tried to mind Pa now, but I could not stay away. Day after day, I'd go to Miller's cave to wait and watch and wonder what is coming out of that egg. One night I couldn't sleep. I got out of my bed and climbed out of my window onto the perch Pa had made for me in the oak tree. But a loud noise broke the stillness of the night. Crack! It was louder than 100 firecrackers on the 4th of July. Crack! I heard it again, this time louder than before. It was coming from Miller's cave. At the first hint of dawn, I headed toward that sound. There in the corner of the cave where I'd left it was the egg, and pushing its way out, like I'd seen so many baby chicks do, was a tiny dragon poking through the shell with its snout. It was love at first sight. Hey there, little feller. Welcome to the world, I sang, soft and low. As I stroked his nose, a sweet little purring whimper came from him. As I touched skin to scale, I knew I was his girl and he was my dragon. I named him Hank. Hank the dragon, just like Bob the dragon. Hank was just a joy to have around. He was a fire-breathing dragon, and he made sure to he kept his temper whenever I was near. Pa wouldn't have seen the sense or the use of having a dragon around who ate you out of house and home. Thankfully, Hank preferred fish, frogs, eels, and insects instead of beef, lamb, chicken, and pork. And he did have a healthy appetite. Ma never wanted to know about Hank. Whenever I wanted to talk about him, she'd cover her ears and sing. She said that having a dragon around had to be the worse than having a field full of critters, but it wasn't. Ma and Pa taught me about caring for living creatures from the day I was born. They taught me about raising lots of things, but they never imagined I would someday care for a critter most folks don't believe even existed. It did take a little time, but whether they liked it or not, Hank was part of our lives. He was an awesome thing, growing to be as big as the barn from tail to snout. Hank was very clumsy when his wings came in, but once he learned how to use them, we'd go flying, mostly at night. Up until then, I'd been afraid of the dark. The shadows and the muffled noises and the complete quiet stillness always seemed to be waiting and watching me. I'd seen our farm from up in my tree perch, but Hank showed me my world from on high, the way a cloud or a bird or a star just might be seeing me. Up there, I saw things what they were, and it was just grand. I think Bob's enjoying our story. Pa was the first one to notice what he called a strangeness happening around our farm. One morning with Samson, our mule, hitched for our work, Pa set out to plow the fields. But all the work had been done. The ground was turned over and seeds had been sown. Pa was plumb flabbergasted. Hank and I tended the crops too. We pulled weeds and kept varmints away and Hank even got me to school before the first bell. Even after all the good he'd done, Ma still didn't want any part of Hank. But when a hot spell hit, her tomatoes began to dry out. Hank hovered above them, fanning away the heat. He saved just about every last one of them. Ma didn't admit it, but she felt beholden to Frank. She began fixing fancy gourmet meals just for him. Eel pot pies, frog leg pudding, and fish and insect stew that Hank just loved. Day by day, Hank was getting bigger. Ma was uneasy about Hank's, Hank's fire-breathing breath. Pa paced with worry while all the corn Hank and I had planted. There was cro corn growing everywhere. Ma cooked as much as she could, but there was just too much. Just when it seemed like the corn would swallow up our farm, Hank grabbed Pa's shovel and dug a wide trench around the cornfield. Then he blew on it with hot breath. What in tarnation, Pa screamed. Ma ran out of the house carrying a bucket of water, but it was too late. The whole field was ablaze. 
We couldn't believe our eyes. Pop, 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 pop. All in our eyes. Hank was making popcorn. It took an entire week to salt and bag it. We sold it all, at a profit. It was the first Dragon Pop popcorn anybody had ever saw or tasted. Oh, it was real good, too. When Ma harvested her tomatoes, Nancy Aikens brought, bought some. She claimed they were med medicinal value. She said they cured her gout. Pretty soon, folks wanted water. I keep slipping my tongue. Let's start that one over. Sometimes I read too fast and get ahead. When Ma harvested her tomatoes, Nancy Aikens bought some. She claimed they had medicinal value. She said they cured her gout. Pretty soon, folks wanted dragon-grown food like they wanted medicine or magic cures. But there was nothing medicinal or magical about it. It was just Hank. The crowds and attention decided his fate. One evening, Ma and I were sitting in front of our pot-bellied stove. She was shelling peas while I read Murdoch's Adventures, Atlas of the Known and Unknown World, a book I'd got from the library that morning. In that instant, I realized what I needed to do. Bob, where are you going? Come here. There we go, buddy. Good morning. Hank and I set out for the dragon-shaped landmass floating in the middle of the ocean. There were dragons everywhere. They put us up in their best hotel, invited us to eat in their best restaurants. Hank felt right at home. When I saw Hank playing run and fly and chase, I knew he'd found the perfect place to be. All in all, it was a great vacation. But at the end, it got real hard. I had to say farewell to Hank, at least for now. Normally I don't get mushy at departing, but when Hank turned to, turned to me and called me Cupcake, I boo-hooed a heap. Just as I was about to board my plane, Hank stood there on the runway trying to hide a wheelbarrow behind his back. His toothy grin lit up a cloudy day. The wheelbarrow was full of... Rocks? Ma squealed in puzzlement. It ain't rocks, mother. They're eggs. Dragon eggs, I exclaimed. Pa beamed right proud. Each egg looked different from the rest. One glowed, one glistened, another one flickered, and one even sparkled. I stood admiring the lot of them. Looking at those eggs, I thought about my Hank. For now, he was, going, he was out there somewhere in the world. I knew I'd see him again, wondering when he was the only thing fixed in my mind. But in the meantime, I knew what I had to do. The same way Pa knew that farming was in his blood. I knew that raising dragons was in mine. There are some things you just know. Well, that was a fun one. I like how at the end, that message of some things you just know. Like, I just knew that I had to be an animal keeper. I've taken care of animals my entire life, from the time I could walk up until now. I've worked in zoos, I've worked for wildlife rescues, I used to raise all kinds of animals when I was little, so sometimes we just know what it is we're supposed to do in the world, and you should always try to pursue the thing that you think that you should be doing in the world. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, but that doesn't mean that you can't keep trying, so Bob's just going to keep being a dragon because that's what he knows how to do. Right, Bob? You want a close up? Can you see yourself? Who's that handsome dragon? There he is. Now you see yourself. Alright. Have a good night.